Thank you. Whoa. Um, good morning. Good morning. Today is an anniversary. Oh, wow. <laughs> Today, mm. 10 years, uh, is when, it's been 10 years since Pastor Thank became you. our full-time pastor, and so we want to recognize that. But he's actually been here a lot longer. Uh, 2007, mm -hmm. I think he came. So the Kellers have been serving us for a long, long time. But today we want to recognize 10 years. We have a wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there, there's, Thank you guys. There's a lot of ways. Hello. 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 Okay. There's a lot of ways that we can honor, and the Bible says that we have to honor. We give honor where honor is due. And this is really what we're trying to do. Okay. And there's a lot of different ways we can honor this man. Number one, he loves to see us here on Sunday. So I would love it if everybody yeah. invited somebody for next week. You know what it would do for him? A lot of times he comes up there, there's only seven or eight people, and it's like, what did I do wrong? Mm. I know I've felt that before. But wouldn't it be great to honor him by filling this place? So we, we believe in this guy. We're not embarrassed of him. We mm. love him. Yeah. He's been yeah. great for us, hasn't he? He's filled our hearts, and he's done his job. Sometimes we blame him for stuff. He's the guy, the big guy on top here at the church. He's the big guy. But, you know, so it's real easy to do that. But we need to love and honor him. And that's really what we like to do. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we're praying for this man today. That you would lift him up. Give him the grace, the spirit, the power to do your will. To help lead us. To give you your vision. To give us the grace and the, the glory and the beauty and the wonder of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Hopefully for ten more years. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate that expression very much. Uh, so, you know, the thing about being here is like I, I'm, I'm laboring uh, in the Word, and I don't want to come here unless I have something good to share, something that's meaningful and helpful. So, like, if, if you labor and you find something good, something valuable, you wanna, what do you want to do? You want to give it away. You want to give it to your friends, people you love and care about. So, if, and then, meanwhile, there's a spiritual battle going on where the, the enemy is saying, like, let's keep everybody who actually needs to hear this message, let's keep those people away. And, and as a result, we're, what I, what I, it's hard is uh, when I realize that we're not moving through things together as a, as a family, as a church, as a community, because we need to be growing together, and then what happens is we move forward, but then if it feels like uh, we're leaving people behind. So, um, and it is, I appreciate what Jeff's saying, because the, the, the messages that we have, they're not just for us, they're for people around us, if we actually believe that the world around us is dying, is hurting. Now, we had a, uh, I began a teaching series last Wednesday uh, that, that is going to continue for two more weeks. It was not well attended, uh, I'm really sad for that because it, uh, it, it would just be so sad to think that people would come so close to getting something that would really help them and change their future and then miss out on it and been involved in so much. And then it is some of the most important teaching that I've, that I've encountered for how humans function, how we work. And it's not just for us, it's for everybody around us. And... Uh, it's critically important because if these fundamental concepts about how humans work, it's if you're going to help people around you at a real way uh, to transform, there, there's some things that are really helpful to understand. The Bible, what I understand is the Bible doesn't often tell you how things work. It just does it. Things that do transform the soul. But I like to get behind, okay, the Bible's, what is the Bible actually doing? So what we saw last Wednesday even is why the Bible's actually written using stories. There's a very important reason for that. Uh, I would have preferred it written as a systematic theology, but no, the Bible knows what it's doing because it's actually written by our Creator. We also understood, found out why worship, music is, is important for us, and how, how prayer is functioning. So I was tempted to go through a, a review of it, 
even this morning, but it's going to happen two more weeks, and like last week, we're just setting this up for the next two weeks. So I would challenge you that the teaching there could change your life, could change your understanding, and actually change the people, the lives of those around you, especially for generations to come, the children. Because what's happening, what needs to happen is breaking generational curses, and we're trying to turn something around, and what we're trying to get a perspective of is this is not a one-generation thing, this is a three-generation thing to get it turned around. And it's not where you are, but where you've come from and where you're going. So it's like we just can't have a, a selfish view, a myopic view of this is for me. It's like, no, I'm, the Lord is seeking to build a people, a community, and it's got to be passed on. There has to be a legacy that's passed on. And really, we, we struggle in passing it on if we don't understand how we got where we are. Like, what are some of the mistakes that were made Think of the title of the book, Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. Well, you know, and as we get to be young adults, and we, we can often complain. You see this on Facebook. Children, adult children, complaining about the toxicity of their family tree. But then what are we doing about it? Because you will be that toxic person for the next generation. You know, and, and like young people are thinking they're so locked in into their own world, but they realize it goes on. We're only here on this planet for a moment. And so what are we going to do? So we're not part of the curse, we're actually part of the blessing, part of the flourishing. We have to learn some things, fundamental differences we have to make for the next generation and for people around us. And of course, when we do that, what we, we begin to understand is that there's a lot more going on in the Bible than we might realize. The Bible knows what it's doing. We think, oh, the Bible didn't really get anything out of it, and maybe you know, it collects dust on the shelf, but th there's a lot going on there. It is written by our creator, of that I'm convinced. Now, a couple of announcements. We, we want to do a my, uh, Madison Heights fireworks cleanup. Civic Center Park on June 30th. The fireworks, I believe, begin like 6.30. By the time 9.30, no, the fireworks don't begin. Like Everybody's gathering around 6.30. And then say around 9.30, close to 10, it's over. And then we begin a quick cleanup, just a way to serve the city. So if you can be a part of that, uh, I want to say to the fathers, bring your children, bring your grandchildren. It's an amazing opportunity to teach virtue if it's not, of course, if it's convenient because, you know, I know there's schedules and everything. Uh, I want to say, you know, two Sundays ago at the nursing home, uh, just a few of us sat around a table and prayed because no one showed up. Last Sunday, the Holy Spirit showed up. The room was filled, and we just had an amazing opportunity to share the gospel and uh, when we went back last Thursday, people were still talking about the message. So I, and I know the Holy Spirit was there. No, so, you know, it's just sometimes when you labor, sometimes you're like, nothing's happening. But like, we got to be consistent. And you might get the same sense where, you know, that I might get about this room right here and now. But like, the influence, the light you have out into the world, in your communities, your families, is so meaningful. Because if it's not us, who's it going to be? So we come here, this, this gathering right here is not the extent of our faith, can't be. This is just the preparation to be re-encouraged, to be reminded, to be inspired, to go out into the world and to make a difference, to live as salt and light, and that's where we want to get to in the message this morning. Now, uh, just, a quick, just a few things from last week's, last Wednesday's teaching. I can't even get into the meat of it, but I want to give you a few things to take with you. Now, um, so I'm going to move quickly here because i got to get the, to the message I have prepared. And I want to take you through Galatians this morning um, in a way that makes a difference. Because Galatians is talking about a whole lot of things that are not relevant for us today. But yet, it's in our Bible. So we're going to make it relevant. Because actually, <laughs> it's written by God. And <laughs> It's amazing, actually. So here, here's what you need to know. You were created for loving relational connections with God and other people. That's why, like, God gave you a body so you could be in relationship. Growth, transformation happens in community. You need someone, something external to yourself to tell you you are loved and lovable. That's a way of just describing it. And of course, you go into a lot of detail there. But if you are not in community, having intimate relationships with other people, not just other people, because you can be in toxic, dysfunctional relationships, but I'm talking about mature believers, at least, you're not growing. It is very easy to stay a whole lifetime as a Christian and be at the same level of immaturity or drop, actually become 
de-churched. You, you just have to know you are designed. God gave you a body to be in relationship with him and other people. Love God, love your neighbor. You, you, you have to let people in. And of course, in order to let people in, you have to take your armor off to let people know the real you. Because if they don't know the real you, you are not loved. You've cut yourself off from love. You have to know that. And a lot of people are out there in the world doing that. So when all is said and done, I love the statement, I am who you say I am. Our identity is formed in community. Now that is to be an, that, that, I, that idea of I am who you say I am begins with our caretakers, mom and dad looking down at us as we're little babies in their arms. Our identity, our self-worth is formed in community even there, but that is an expression meant to be by design an expression of a relationship with the Father. God reveals himself as Father. Now, when God does that in the New Testament, it's because he's revealing his most personal nature to us. And I think we use father and dad so often, we, we lose sight of the fact that father, if you're called father, what an honor and a privilege because that title father, by, by the way, when we use titles like father, mother, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, do you know the reason why it does, we use those terms partly is because it, it creates an emotional connection at the core of us. It's, it's an expression of intimacy. So it's not... We use Mr. and Mrs., I think, in a slightly different way. The idea of authority is expressed. But these other terms, in terms of endearment, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, it creates this emotional bond with people. And a lot of times in our society, we've gotten away from using those expressions. Because, and that itself is an expression of the fact that the family is breaking down in society at large. Let's come back now. Those are meant, the, the relationship with our caretakers is meant to be an expression of God as Father, he's revealing through that expression the very intimate nature of himself because he is the one who can actually and does say, I am who you say I am. And Galatians itself is going to teach us, who are we? We are loved. We are sons and daughters brought into God's family. And the reason why that is communicated to us is because it changes our identity. Once our identity is changed, we live out of that identity. And out of that identity, we change the world because we bring other people into that love. Now, you can sit in a church a long time, and that, that process never happens. The Bible calls that a religious person. We talked about the idea of religious people and where, where that comes from, because it is very possible to sit in sermon after sermon and experience no transformation. We talked about why that happens, the very mechanics of that happening last Wednesday. I can't cover that now. The brain is dependent on relationships for to properly develop and organize itself. The, the brain is dependent on relationships to develop properly and organize itself. It's sad when you meet someone who's in their teenage years or even as a child or even as an adult with some time, and you can, you can, once you understand these concepts, you see you can tell the kind of childhood that a person has just by through a conversation. And a lot of times it's heartbreaking. And the, but it's not over yet because God designs a functioning, healthy community that is saturated in love, the love that looks like God for us, is meant to be transformative. But what sadly can happen in the church is people bring their armor with them to church and people never truly know them. Therefore, they cut themselves off from transformation. The brain is dependent on relationships to develop properly and organize itself. I wish I could get into more of that. Our neural connections synchronize with our relational connections. Wiring our relational experiences into our brain circuits. Wiring our relational connections into our brain circuits. That's what we were talking about last Wednesday. Moreover, when our early relationships are deficient, relationships later in life can lead to significant change in our brains and healing in our souls. Now, we're talking about neuroscience, but we can understand why God gave us the church. It's beautiful. We are created for relationships, and relationships remain central to our well-being and spiritual development throughout our lives. So we start off in the process, as we say, we, the entrance to the church is we're experiencing other people's self-sacrificial love for us. But through growth and maturity, we were brought into the love of God, the Trinity, the love of the Trinity, which is what? Reciprocal and mutual. So you start off with people loving you, and you have nothing to contribute. Just like we had nothing to contribute to our salvation, Jesus on the cross. But through, we are loved into loving. And God does that through relationships such that we get to the place in our maturity where we can contribute. 
So I go, we go to the nursing home. Am I getting anything from those people? Actually, yes. But it's not money. And I already have, you know, they, like, I, I already feel loved. I'm not going there because I'm lonely. But I, I'm going there because I want to express, out of the abundance of what God gave me, I want to express, bring people into the love that we have. Receive from the Father. So the absence of close relationships is a health risk factor more important. Quick statistic for you. The absence of close relationships is a health risk factor. Are anybody lonely today? Is there anybody that has few friends, no friends? Not reciprocal mutual friendships? The absence of those friendships is a health risk factor more important than smoking, obesity, and physical activity in its effect on mortality rates. You were created to be loved. If you're not loved, some bad stuff's happened to you. You're meant to experience God's love to be brought back into community. But not everybody gets that, and it affects their mortality rate, the, long, the length of their life. Don't we have some psalms that talk about that? Our way of emotion... The way our emotion systems determine well-being is highly influenced by our primary environment. And, and I say this to moms and dads who are, are bringing up babies, children. The way our emotion systems determine well-being, how, are we okay? Am I okay? Is highly influenced by our primary environment, including our relational environment. If we have a negative, toxic, dysfunctional atmosphere in our homes growing up, it influences our relationships and our emotion systems, which means it creates something that we need to be healed from. So what you don't get healed from gets passed on because you create an environment that is unstable for your children. So one of the most important things we have to give our children is consistency. Is that so complex? So what really messes with kids is the ups and the downs, the ups and the downs, the ups and the downs. You, partly why we give our children ups and downs is because we're emo our emotional stability is connect connected or attached to them instead of our emotional stability connected to God. Like my sense of self-worth is determined on if my kid is treating me the way I think needs, I need to be treated. And if, he, if I don't get that from them, I lash out. So what am I doing? I'm passing on the sins of the fathers to the next generation. You just have to realize that. Because what doesn't get healed gets passed on. That toxicity is going to get passed on. What you don't get healed from gets passed on because you create an environment that is unstable for your children and you have to fight against inconsistency. Don't give your child a PlayStation 5, get them consistently, get them a consistently loving environment at home. Way more valuable off the charts. More valuable. PlayStation 5 has its advantages because once you give them that, you won't have to provide them a, a stable, loving environment because they'll hardly miss it. But yet, there's, that'll affect how long they end up living. Is that a problem? Probably. Yes. I'll say this. The process, the process we're talking about, I'm going to give you two blanket generalization statements that really communicate a lot in a few words. And they say in a few words a lot of things we've said in the past. And I love these statements. The process that we've been talking about, and you know that we have a three-step process, journaling out your story, communicating that story in the presence of an empathetic slash compassionate witness, so that part three, you can reassign the meaning of those past experiences. But that process is working through pain in the presence of love over time. I wanna say that again, that's what the process is. And you can do that with anybody, people that are hurting around you, this is what you, we need to be doing to show them the love of Jesus in this culture and in this society and at this time. The process is working through pain in the presence of love over time. That is transformative. The overarching goal of therapy or counseling or whatever you would call it is to convert implicit memory to explicit memory. So here's what happens, and here's how we, like to, we described it last Wednesday. This, this process is like a zipper. We have implicit memory, and knowing, 
which includes emotions. The emotional system exists from day one when you're born, and it is a communication network. That's a few times. Okay, so I want to turn to Galatians now. Can we do that? Or we just go home right now and just think about what we just heard. I, 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 mm, I was torn. Like, I don't want to... Yeah, we're half hour in. No, that's not... That's a, okay, so we're going to use this time to set us up for next week. Have you, anybody here read Galatians? I, I, I would say raise your hand, but maybe not. Just think about, have you read Galatians? Because, like, do you know that there's, there's an irony about the book of Galatians? Galatians is what kind of started the Reformation. As a result of the Reformation, one way of looking at that is there's a whole bunch of denominations as a result because we split off from the Catholic Church. And you think about what a different history, church history, would have had if the reformers, because Martin Luther is said to have said he wanted to reform the Catholic Church. But instead what ended up happening is we formed a separate church. You imagine if that if you'd, we had born into an environment where there's only one... Okay, let's leave off the whole idea of the Eastern Orthodox for now, based off the Great Schism, I think 12th century. Let's, let's leave off that for now. But just, we're thinking about the Catholic Church and the Ref, Ref, Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, of which we are descendants. Imagine if the Reformers had stayed within the Catholic Church and had gotten that right and figured it out so that we could all get along. How much would we have more influence in the world or less? So there's a sense in which we recover justification by faith alone from Galatians. Like Martin Luther considered the book of Galatians his wife. That's that's the way he used to, he was used to describe it. Okay? Yeah, I know. I know. I'm sorry. That's just how he did it. Hans, I forget her name. Boris. So Here's the irony about that, though. Galatians, that's the idea of justification by faith alone starting in Galatians 2.16, but when we get to the end of chapter 3, Galatians 3.29 says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, free or slave, like male or female, we're all one in Christ, which means we all need to be able to eat at the same table. What he's, what he's getting to in the argument there is that we all need to have this expression of unity And that is an apologetic to the watching world that we really are from God. So wait a minute. We all need to be eating at the same table, whether you're a Jewish Christian or a Gentile Christian, because what was happening? Influence was coming into the church from Jerusalem. So James, the pastor of Jerusalem, sending sending people to Galatia and is interacting actually also with Peter, Cephas, in Galatia, Galatians. And as a result, Peter is pulling back. Peter's pulling back. He was eating with Gentiles, but now he's not. Paul sees this as a threat to the gospel. Like, you, you remember in Galatia, uh, Corinthians where Paul says, I've become all things to all men that I might win some. To the Jews, I became a Jew. To the Greeks, I uh, like a Greek. He's like, I'm going to go into any culture, and I'll take on all your culture as much as I can because I want to build a relationship with you so I can share the gospel. But when it comes to Galatians, he's like, no, uh uh-uh. Why? Because if you get to the point where you're violating the gospel, the core of the gospel, Paul stands up and says, no no way. So what was happening was Peter was listening to the influencers from Jerusalem and was pulling back from his table fellowship with other Gentiles. Gentiles simply means people who are not Jews. The word in the original language simply means nations, ethne. We're ethnic, right? So Paul says, no, that's not going to happen because the whole point of the gospel is to, one of the ways of looking at it is to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. Through Abraham's seed, all the nations are to be blessed. Which means there was all kinds of division. You go all the way back to Genesis. We do every Sunday, actually. The Tower of Babel, everybody splitting off as a result of sin, idolatry against God. What the gospel has to do, what God is obligated to do, because he's covenant God and creator God, he's obligated to bring creation back together again. There's warring and these factions and everybody's at each other's throat. The gospel is God's answer to it. So if Peter is actually starting to segregate himself from Gentiles, people who are not uh, 
practicing the Torah, that creates a big problem because Paul says, wait a minute, the whole point of the gospel is to bring people together. Now you're saying the gospel, as you're explaining it, is separating people. And Paul says, no way, Jose, as it were. Now, having said that, Paul is writing to defend himself against accusations that his gospel was secondhand and muddled. So he spends the first two chapters defending his apostleship. Why is that? Because these people coming from Jerusalem are saying this. You have to, yes, Jesus, we can claim that Jesus is the Messiah. <coughs> but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't still practice and obey the Torah. Now, that would have been fine in Jerusalem because most, most people there becoming Christians were were Jews, and they continued to practice the Torah most likely because it hadn't been figured out yet. And so in Galatia, if there's Jews there, they accept Christ, they're happy to practice, continue to practice the law, but then what about Gentiles who don't know the law? And now there's, there's division in the church. Paul's like, no way. And they're trying to say, see, this gospel Paul, the reason why Galatians chapter 1 and chapter 2 starts off with Paul defending his apostleship is because they're saying, Paul, who is this guy? He's not teaching the full gospel because the full gospel says you have to add Torah onto Jesus being the Messiah. So get rid of him. And like Peter's being rebuked, you know, Peter probably used to being corrected. So when Peter's corrected by James, he's like, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. We're supposed to add Torah onto it. I don't think Jesus ever covered that. So yeah, okay. And, and you know, I don't think Peter's like some idiot. Like he's like he's trying to do the right thing by withdrawing table fellowship. Remember, Peter has that uh, that vision before he goes to the house of Cornelius with that that blanket's coming down. So he, there's just you know, and God God says to him, all animals are are clean for you. What is that? What is God saying to Peter there? <sighs> Those. Those commandments I gave in the Torah are no longer relevant. They've been fulfilled in Christ, essentially. But then, then Paul's going back his old ways. He's like trying to, trying to get it figured out. Paul sees this as a problem. He's, so Paul is urging his male Jesus followers among his Gentile converts not to submit to circumcision. So you might say, well, Paul, let's, let's say, because there's people out there today, there's whole denominations that say, hey, we got to practice Torah and the result of the Messiah. And that's not the main point of this message. Like Seventh-day Adventists, bless their hearts. I like Seventh-day Adventists. I like the, you know what I like about them? The fact that they read their Bibles. Do I agree with them? Absolutely not. But there are people today that would say, yeah, you still have to practice the Torah. But see, the thing is, you might, if you say you have to practice Torah, you might say, okay, well, get rid of Paul. He's suspect. But then you would also have to get rid of Luke, which means you're getting rid of one of the Gospels because Luke wrote Acts, and we also know he wrote the Gospel of Luke. So are you, do you really want to get, a, get rid of half of your Bible easily? No. Like, maybe something else is going on. People will say, see, Jesus in Matthew 23 the eight woes to the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He says, do what they tell you to do. And they say, it's to practice the law. But you know what Jesus, and they say, see, Jesus, if, he, if we was getting rid of the law, he would have said in Matthew 23, you don't have to keep the law anymore. And if you go back to his first sermon, Sermon on the Mount, he says, uh, you have heard it said. I didn't, and then he goes on, he says, uh, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. And then in Matthew 23, he's still saying keep the law. But you know what he does the very next chapter, chapter 24 and 25? We call it the Olivet Discourse, his fifth, fifth, <laughs> fifth and final sermon. He says, the whole temple is going away. Now, here's the thing. James says, James, the pastor in Jerusalem, wrote the, God, the book of James in your, in your Bible, New Testament. He says, if you offend in one point of the law, you're guilty of all of it. So we have this ten tendency to break the law of Moses into three categories, but that's not how the Jews saw it. Civil, ceremonial, Levitical, like there's another term. I never caught on to that like, because like, I was like, that's, I don't see that in the scripture. Show me in the scripture where it divides the law into three segments. You only have to keep one. The problem with it, Jesus is saying, look, you can't practice the law because as a result of judgment, the whole temple is going away. The law of Moses 
is based off temple sacrifice. How do you practice the law of Moses without the temple? It cannot be done. There are no sacrifices. There is no alternative location to where you can sacrifice an animal to Yahweh outside of Jerusalem in the temple. This prescribed in great detail. So Jesus is saying, yeah, that whole temple you like, remember on his way during Passion Week, he says, hey, disciples, you're so excited this temple, the Herod's remodeling is finally going to be finished. Oh yeah, you're excited about that? Not one stone is going to be left upon another. This whole temple sacrificial, why? Because Jesus had already said in his first sermon, I came to fulfill the law. Paul, has, he's, Paul, Paul spent 14 years figuring this out. I'm really happy for it. So that he understands the gospel at the deepest level. Peter and James might be saying to themselves, wow, I wish Jesus had talked more about this. We could have asked better questions. But the Lord knew that he was going to send Paul, an apostle due out of, you know, born and due out of due season, who had a direct encounter with the Messiah, what Paul is saying is this. You think I don't know the full expression of the gospel and what we're supposed to be doing with reference to the Torah? It was communicated to me directly by the Messiah himself. That's his credential. The road to Damascus. Paul was called. So he defends that. Now, I want to read to you, we, like, people go back and forth whether Thessalonians was written first or Galatians, but they're written right around A.D. 50, 51. Okay, so it's like, in as far as Paul's epistles, it's like the, the Galatians and Thessalonians, right there at the beginning. Notice what it says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, okay, because this is going to set us up for this message, because once you understand the context, you're going to understand, like, whoa, that's why all this is going on in Galatians. We read 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, and we gloss right over it, and it says this, For they report about us, Christians, what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Now, we read that and like, oh, that's good. They, they quit being idolaters. Like, and it's kind of like no big deal. That was a huge deal. So hold that. So right at the beginning, an issue that's going to come up is the idea of turning from idolatry. I'm going to explain to you why that is hugely significant, not only for the Thessalonians, but also for Galatians. Now, I want to add to that, though, one more text, just one more. Galatians 2.11 says this, when, and it describes what I just told you. When Peter came to Antioch, I stood up to him face to face. He was in the wrong. Before certain persons came from James... Peter was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself because he was afraid of the circumcision people. The rest of the Jews did the same, joining him in this play acting. Even Barnabas was carried along by, this, by their sham. But when I saw that they weren't walking straight down the line of gospel truth, I said to Cephas in front of them all, look here. You're a Jew, but you're, you've been living like a Gentile. How can you force Gentiles to become Jews? That might be a little bit confusing until you understand the backstory, until you understand the context in which a verse like that would have emerged and been written. Now, let's set up the context. You can see how significant this is. Because right now, you may say to yourself, I don't have a lot of temptation to, li- to people aren't compelling me to fulfill the law of Moses. I don't feel a lot of social pressure to do that. But if we back up one layer, we're going to see everything is saying in Galatians is hugely relevant to us even today. Hugely relevant today. Now, let's get there. See if we, I'm not going to get very far. Well, in Paul's world, everyone had to worship the gods. Everybody had to worship the gods. There were household gods. There were massive temples. There were temples to Caesar also. Even uh, temples to Rome. The gods were everywhere. They were, there were weekly and monthly and annual processions and festivals and sacrifices. And everyone joined in. But why? Everyone joined in and any who didn't would be noticed and called out. Okay? Anybody who didn't join in in the worship of the gods would be called. You know why, though? Why, though? Why would people care? Oh, I didn't see you guys at temple worship. I didn't see you in the annual procession. 
Why would people care? Because this, here's why. It was assumed throughout the ancient world that if anything bad happened to the city, such as a famine, fire, flood, plague, or hostile attack, it was because the gods were angry. What would most enrage them was, it said, neglect. Anyone who failed to perform the regular duties and to take part in the regular festivals was therefore assumed to be in danger to the city and to the community. Like, and here's the best example I found. Remember when the, the pandemic first started, COVID, and we had to wear masks, and we couldn't go certain places? And do you, really, do you remember on the news, um, certain people were getting very upset, and there were fights happening when someone would go out into society, and, and they were wearing their mask, and they would find someone who wasn't. And they were perceived as, okay, you're not wearing your mask. You're a threat to all of us. We could all die because you're not wearing your mask. That's exactly the kind of pressure, except way more, that was happening in Paul's world for people who would not participate in the worship to the gods and to Caesar. Do you understand that? To be a Christian is is a huge statement. So when we read in 1 Thessalonians 1.9, for they report about us, what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned from God to idols turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Like that saying, you Thessalonians are willing to, to, to risk your lives and, and your business and your, your social standing, your status, by not participating in everything the city's doing with reference to worship. Okay, so that's a big part of the equation. Here's a second part. Guess what? So that's part A. Here's part B. Once you get this part B, then you understand Galatians. Part B is this. The Jews were exempt from all of that. Who made them exempt? Julius Caesar did. And then on from that, Augustus Caesar. The first and second Caesar. Why? Because the Jews helped Caesar in his war against Ptolemy. Ptolemy was another Roman. The Jews helped him, and as a result, he gave them something he didn't give to any other culture, an exemption status. The Jews were exempt from it. Jewish communities, a significant body in most cities in the Roman world, had been given explicit permission to abstain from worshiping the gods. The reasons were pragmatic. Rome had discovered that Jewish people believed that their god was the only god. They would rather die than worship any other so-called gods. Julius Caesar, in gratitude for Jewish support during the war with Pompey, did I say Ptolemy? I meant Pompey. I don't know what I said. Bestowed benefits on both Palestinian and diaspora Jews. Diaspora. The Jews living in Israel and, and the Jews that were scattered around the Mediterranean. And various cities in the empire followed suit by giving Jews certain rights. Josephus quotes these decrees as well as letters from Roman officials relating to the same issues. So mainly where we find this out is this, uh, the writings of Josephus. He has these writings called the Antiquities of the Jews. Uh, Josephus uh, was a Jew, and then he was made a Roman general. And then he writes this history, these multiple histories. Fascinating stuff. He, re- he recounts all these things. So in his writings in the Antiquities, he talks about the right to assemble or to have a place of assembly. No other religious group was allowed to even assemble if Rome didn't give him permission. They didn't give anybody permission except for the Jews. They gave, he, they gave him the right to keep the Sabbath. They gave him the right to uh, have their ancestral food, the right to decide their own affairs, the right to contribute money. In addition, numerous general references are found in Josephus to the right to follow their customs, to keep their holy rights and regulations. So here's what, a couple things there. Caesars, they found out that, one, they wouldn't pray to Caesar or worship Caesar, but they would pray for Caesar. And this goes back to Jeremiah 29. Seek the welfare of the city. Seek the shalom of the city. For in their prosperity, you will find prosperity. Some Jews are still practicing this. But here's the other second part of it. Jews would rather die than follow along with worshiping false gods. 
There's a, a story we found uh, of jo- Josephus writes about the first time that Pilate, this character you find in your New Testament, brought the Roman standards. The standard is this was an eagle. In the, over the, under the cover of darkness, Pilate snuck in the Roman eagles and postured them at certain key points of the city, even around the temple. The next morning, the Jews obviously find out and see it, and they rally, and they come up to Pilate, and he, they say, get rid of these, get rid of them, get rid of them, get rid of them. And Pilate calls his Roman soldiers around and says, if, he says to the Jews, if you don't get out of here and drop it, I will kill you right here and now. You know what the Jews did? They got down on, their, on the ground and laid their neck bare, and they said, kill us now then. That was their response. As a result, Pilate changed his mind and had the eagles, the standards, removed to the city of Caesarea, an appropriate location because the city was named after Caesar. That's how the Jews were. They're like, okay, it's just easier. Jews, unlike other people, they're not going to compromise. It's just easier to let them do what they got to do. They'll still pay the taxes and all this stuff. Like, just just let them do what they got to do. That's the Jews. Okay, so now, having said that, the Jews were the exemption, the exception, exception to this rule. They had an exemption status. Here comes Christians. Are Christians Jews? The first Christians were. Were the disciples Jews? Pretty sure they were. Right? So they were used to following the Torah. In Jerusalem, Christians were still following the Torah. But what happens when Paul now is starting to share the gospel out in places in Roman provinces, in Roman cities, where there aren't Jews that practice the Torah? Those Christians out there on the peripheral, moving towards you know, Rome, they would now be seen as, you better come and worship the gods. If you don't, you're going to be persecuted because everyone in the city is going to blame anything bad that happens on you. Can you see how they would face great social pressure, but then here, the, the Christians would want to say, oh yeah, we are children of Abraham. Does Paul talk about anything about Christians being children of Abraham in Galatians? Absolutely. He says it explicitly. You are heirs, children of Abraham. They're in Galatians 3. Which is to say, the Christians, so here's what's happening. The, the Jews in Jerusalem, James is sending a delegate saying, hey, look it, if these Christians don't con- begin and either continue or begin to practice the Torah, we Christians are going to lose our status as being an exception to worshiping the gods. We're going to experience persecution as a result. So just go along with everything. Just tell them to practice the Torah. Meanwhile, also, you had Jews who were saying, hey, we really think we're having this Reformation movement. We can't have a bunch of Jews who aren't practicing the Torah because if they stop practicing the Torah, we're going to lose out on the possibility that God might come back and, and rescue us from the Romans. So here, Christians would be under intense pressure both from Jewish Christians uh, because of Rome, but also Jews who thought the Christians, the Jewish Christians, were a threat to their being obedient enough for Yahweh to come back and rescue them from the Romans. Therefore, that is all that to say, the the Christians were under intense pressure to keep the Torah it would have been much easier to go along. And the reason why Paul, who's very reasonable, he's, and he's very like, hey, I want to get along with every culture. I become all things to all men. The reason why he stands up and, t- and, and takes a stand on this issue is because he will go with you down the road as far as he can, but when it comes to the point of compromising the gospel, he's like, nope, not doing it. Not doing it. Not compromising the gospel. Now, so we are not going to command people to get circumcised. Not going to do it. And how does he end Galatians? He says it 
the same thing he's, he's, all, uh, he's going to say in Corinthians later on. He says, whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you're a new creature. So what happens, what Paul is doing in large part in Galatians is he's saying, he, what is the actual expression of who is a Christian? Is the expression that, hey, we got to keep the Torah? <clears throat> By the way, let's back up. Jesus says in, in Matthew 23, when he's rebuking the Pharisees, <clears throat> he's saying, do what they tell you to do, but they don't practice the law. They don't practice what they preach, okay? Now, the Pharisees, the primary thing about the Pharisees, the Sadducees were in control of the temple. What the Pharisees were doing is they were taking the, Le- the, the Levitical priests had higher standards than anybody as they entered into the temple precincts. What the Pharisees were doing is saying, they're taking the higher standards of the Levites and, and practicing those for themselves in day-to-day life and then commanding other people to do the same. So they actually did practice the law, but they left off the, uncertain, the, the essential point. And that point is Jesus is what he's pointing out is they are laying off the relationship with God. Therefore, they fail to practice justice, mercy, and faith. Pistis. Faith being the relational aspect. So what we were saying last Wednesday is faith is this. Faith is truth plus relationship equals faith. Because faith is that loyalty aspect. It's not just that we know the truth, we practice the truth out of loyalty. It's that relationship aspect. Paul, uh, what Jesus is saying is these people, yeah, they, they tithe mint and cumin, they even tithe their, their herbs, but they don't have a relationship with God. That's the problem. So the expression of who the people of God are, <clears throat> what's being corrected with the Torah, and this, it's very easy to say, oh, <clears throat> okay, I practice the Torah. Meanwhile, you don't have a relationship with God. It's very easy to say, oh, I don't do anything bad. Mean, I'm a Christian, but I don't have a relationship with God. The whole point of the New Testament church is God is going to send his Holy Spirit so that everybody in the church has a relationship with God. That's what has to transform you. That God as Father loves you. God himself got up on a cross to die for you. All your sin, all your shame, he took it on himself, paid the penalty so that he could be back in relationship with you. Does God love you? Why wouldn't you want to be in a relationship with someone like that? Do you think it's because we are deceived as humans thinking some other experience will bring us more pleasure than our relationship and identity in God? Okay, I said there was pressure, there would be pressure from Rome. You have to understand, do you know that Paul was using language that was used about the Caesars in worship to them? The word gospel is a Roman word used to describe what Augustus Caesar was doing. There's inscriptions we've found, and it says, the good news, euangelion, means gospel, it's the same word in the New Testament. The good news of Augustus, who has brought us a new world of peace. They called him Savior. On the coins of Augustus Caesar, it said, divine son which is to say, son of God. So here's just three examples. Son of God, Savior, Gospel were all Roman words used talking to describe Caesar. Paul is using these explicitly on purpose to say the true Gospel, the true Son of God, the true Savior, the true peace is through Jesus. It is not through Caesar. Caesar's fake. In other words, Paul's language is, is, is carefully crafted to go against the prevailing culture of the time. Here's what Paul was willing to do. Here's where it becomes very relevant for us. Paul stands up against the culture, whether it's the Romans and the Greeks or even the Jews. He is very willing to stand up against the culture when it contradicts the truth of who God is. We Christians today are just as tempted oftentimes to, hey, okay, let me back up. So there's, the idea is there's this unwritten social contract with the, with the Christians. Look, as long as you go along with worship and worshiping of the gods, 
or as long as you Christians go along with following the Torah, we will leave you alone. You won't bother us. Today, it's very similar, but slightly different. The idea of Christians, you can argue about your doctrine and prayer and which denomination, all these things. As long as you Christians aren't having an influence out there in the world, you can do whatever you want to do. No problem. When Christians have a voice and stand up and speak against things that violate God's law, that's when the forces of darkness start coming. So for Christians just to be bickering and fighting against one another, oh, you're not a good enough Christian, you don't believe the right thing. Oh, you, like, do you see how far away that is from the gospel? So there's a deep irony with reference to, yes, Galatians got us faith, justification by faith alone, but in some sense it led to a division whereby we have a lot less influence out there in the world because we're fighting against each other instead of the enemy. What Christians always have to do for their time and their context is, is sort through, filter through the culture, because the culture is always going to have two things. We always say this. The culture is going to have things that are beautiful, because the culture is created by people who are made in the image and likeness of God. What is culture? Culture is a value system expressed. Art forms would be a primary way. Education right? It's value systems. Are there values? There's value systems like in every movie, every TV show. The news is coming from a value system. But there's going to be things out in the culture where we would say, yes, that is beautiful because it's created by people who are made in the image and likeness of God. But here's the second part of culture. Cultures always are always going to also have things that are dark and depraved and twisted, distorted, distortions of who the one true and living God is because all of us have this fallen nature that is an enemy against God. So the gospel comes along and says, these things are beautiful. These things are twisted and destructive. And as long as Christians are fighting against each other, we don't have a chance. We don't have to worry about going out there in the world and telling people things that might ultimately offend them. Now, if we're going to tell people things that might ultimately offend them, can you see why love would be important? We have no right to tell anybody out there in the world anything if, if we haven't established that it's coming from a place of love and care and concern. And do you see why Paul would say in Galatians 5, verse 13, he says, what is the whole point of the whole book is faith working itself out in love. So what Paul is saying in Galatians is the expression of who the people of God actually are is not the Torah or works of the law. It is faith in Jesus Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. Faith in Christ, it is loyalty to God's Son. And the, the idea of how do we know who the people of God are? They take up their cross like Jesus said and follow me. And that's why Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And it's not me that's living, it's Jesus living in and through me out into the world, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he says, he says at the end of the book, I think in 6.13, he says, I bear on my body the marks of the crucified Messiah. He has been willing to suffer, motivated by love, to show people the one true and living God. That's the message in a nutshell of Galatians. Paul's message was very Jewish. But what he's telling his people, the churches, the Christians there in Galatia, that region of southern Turkey, he's telling people, you have to be willing to face persecution to communicate the reality of the gospel. You're not likely going to be able to... Okay, so in Corinth, that whole exception clause was working. We have ver like Acts 18, Paul encounters Gallio. Gallio says, you all a bunch of Jews, handle your business. And he says this to the Jews and to the Christians. So Gallio there in Corinth and in Greece area is saying, hey, you Christians can take, get access to the Jewish exemption clause that's been a reality since Julius. But over in Galatia, that wasn't working. And Paul is saying, okay, it's not working here in Galatia, but it doesn't matter. We're still going to have to be willing to face persecution in order to live out the reality of the gospel. In some societies and sometimes in some cultures, we face persecution as Christians, and other times we have peace. But we cannot just be like, just go along with whatever the culture says because we want to be the nice person. 
the get along person. What we want to be doing is loving people so well that when we tell people a hard truth that contradicts their whole lifestyle, perhaps, they receive it in love. They tell us, they, they receive it from us because they know we're doing it out of love. And that is what Jesus says, says to do in Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth. If salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. People do not light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket. Rather, they put it on a lampstand and give its light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's probably enough for today, right? I, would, I wanted to add this, that if you're going to follow the Torah, Paul says twice in Galatians 3.10 and 5.3, if you're going to follow the law, you've got to follow the whole thing. So we could add on to that. Good luck with that. Because in 20 more years after this book is written, the temple precincts won't even exist. What's on the temple today? An Islamic mosque. All that is by design. God is, is causing people to go out into the world. So we have that opportunity to be salt and light. That's the part that's really relevant. Maybe circumcision isn't very relevant. Not to you? Yeah, re- definitely not to you. But guess what? Sharing the gospel, the truth of the gospel, that's very relevant, isn't it? And the thing is, let's ask ourselves this question, and then we'll be done. Are you qualified? Are you qualified to share the countercultural aspects of our faith with other people? And the answer will be is, first, do you have a relationship with them? Are you loving people well? Don't try to tell people God hates them if they don't first know that God loves them. You know, it's, it's just twisted. Start a YouTube channel telling people how much God is against them. That'll be a good ministry for us, right? It's like, no, we want to tell people countercultural things because of the truth of the gospel, but it's got to be faith, loyalty to God, working itself out in through love. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. One way of summarizing the book. Let's pray. Father, I pray you help us figure out how to work this out in real life. Lord, I pray you give us the courage, the reminder to love people, uh, that, that we are loved that we are to love other people well out of that abundance. Lord, we are overwhelmed with life oftentimes. We're just overwhelmed. Like there's so much going on. Lord, we can hardly leave our homes, it seems sometimes, without feeling attacked. And Lord, we need your empowering Holy Spirit to remind us, but to empower us to actually be able to love people who are unlovely as we are ourselves oftentimes. Lord, help us to remember what our mission is. Lord, our life is so short, we don't want to miss out on the opportunities. Lord, help us to uh, boldly proclaim and be salt and light. Lord, we want to make you proud because you're our, our Father, our Abba. Lord, help us not to be compromisers, lukewarm. Just go along with all the elements of culture, trying to gain their acceptance. Lord, what we really care about is you and your love for us because you've already accepted us. And if you've accepted us, then everything else is good. Lord, help us to be Christians, legit Christians. We thank you for this understanding you've given us even this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are dismissed. We're not dismissed. I got, you, know, I, you know I got wrapped up in a message if I say... <sighs> okay, I got to cool down. Now... I want to say this quickly, because we're going to celebrate. As disciples, followers of Jesus, why did he give us this meal? We want to feel, we want to be able to feel our feelings even in this moment, because he's given us an, an opportunity to experience his love for us. This is one way of looking at this, this meal we're going to eat. That his body was broken for us. That his blood was poured out for us. This is a reminder of how much God loves us. So, uh, for all those who have followed Jesus uh, in baptism, have entered into the family, uh, we welcome you to the Lord's table to partake uh, in this meal together. So let's break this bread together. 
we're going to play a song. We're going to come up, gather, take the, the bread and the wine, the fruit of the vine, back to our seats. And then we're going to have a time of introspection and see what the Holy Spirit would tell us right now. I want to welcome everyone. I want every, if, you're not, if you can't come to the table, make today the day you can come to the table, okay? I mean, you think of everything that God did to, to welcome us to his table. All that Paul went through to make sure we don't lose sight of the fact that everybody should be welcome to the family because Jesus died for the world, loved the world. We're going to have a time of introspection, and we'll take it together as the body of Christ. You have a song for us? All right, I want to welcome everybody. Please, please come.